was really bad.
Uh, yes, the live stream is running. But it's not. Yeah. Control for now. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm gonna. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about that. You were. Uh... Oh, look out! Look out! Okay.
Testing, testing. Testing. All right, thank you so much.
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I think I, I, I sent an invite to that one as well. So I'll just let me. Yeah. Okay. So we just call that one for the day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna go to the settings. I'm gonna set it so. I know, yeah, but it's, it's, this is like RC Capital Oh, is that the problem? It seems like the internet might be dead. But actually, it wouldn't bring us. Oh. Yeah. 
Hi. Here we are. Is that the right one? Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, we. It's. I don't know how to explain this, but it came through. We we're using this other laptop as our primary laptop. What is the name? Uh, it's Marcy Captor. Just, just like that. It's, it's like this felt like that, but no space. Okay. But the, there's she, there's two actually two accounts that they have. Uh, okay. Um, could you try could you try calling me back in just a minute? Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Okay. 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 Thanks. All right. I'm gonna quit quit out of this one. Oh, oh, let's answer this one. Oh, 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 oh. She's going to call back. Yeah, let's hopefully she's going to work. Maybe it's a log in and log out. Yes. It's okay. Yes, and I'll move down. No, stay there. I'm going to come back. Seminar 
on social welfare, full employment, and equity. And I'm Will Milberg. I'm the Dean at the New School for Social Research and a Professor of Economics here for, for many years. And, and on behalf of the New School and the New School for Social Research, I, I just want to welcome you to be able to host you. We are, of course, uh, many, we have many friends uh, from the New School, uh, many friends in this audience, so it feels very comfortable and very much appropriate to, to host this conference here about a new New Deal. Of course, a new New Deal sounds completely preposterous, given the rightward turn in, in government policy today, backtracking on fill in the blank, climate change, immigration rights, health insurance, retirement security. And yet, the is clearly absolutely right. And I'm with you all the way. Well, economically, we've had wage stagnation for decades that we know about. Politically, complete dissatisfaction, finally, with the, the middle and search for real responses to long term problems, labor market, retirement, insecurity. The new school has very strong New Deal, and I wanted to take one minute to point those out before I introduce uh, Professor Pollard. The new school, of course, had Eleanor Roosevelt on its first board of advisors in 1919 when we were founded, and, and we come up to our centennial, and we very, very much honor the founding of, of the new school kind of rogue higher, uh, yeah, higher education institution, which uh, came downtown from Columbia University, as many of you have today, and uh, started a new way of talking and thinking about the philosophy, politics, economics, and culture. The new, so Eleanor Roosevelt was a member of the original advisory board of the new school in 19. And of course, in the actual New Deal, uh, a number of New School economists played an important role. And uh, Adolf Lowe, uh, who covered an exchange, Matt Forsett or something, a quite remarkable exchange between Andrew Roosevelt and Adolf Professor of Economics here regarding the reconstruction of Europe coming out of World War II. Uh, Gerhard Kohn, one of the also the original. Uh, was instrumental in the writing of the Full Employment Act of 1945, became uh, Truman's Employment Act of 1946, who uh, was an expert on public finance and interested in how Fishing was linked in the democratic process of determining and deliberating the public good. Foreign to us today. To citizens. Frank, this my left, Frank, as a graduate of my department, as a doctorate from our economics, Frank uh, and that economic program continues to produce uh, Unorthodox, so a heterodox economists who both question kind of mainstream free market economists, but also who uh, really work hard to think about alternative forms of political economy uh, based on notions of prosperity and, and, and economic justice. And I said, Kelton is here, one of our graduates, uh, Heather Boucher. We had the rare distinction of chief economists from both losing. Candidates in the last election, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, both had chief economists who were PhDs in school. Um, we continue to fight, as you do, and uh, we continue to produce, I think, useful science as a for social reason. So, welcome to the new school. I'm, again, very proud to have you here at the beginning of this institution, and I want to introduce Robert Pollack, an American biologist. Professor of Biological Sciences at Columbia, Dean of Columbia College, for a guy, from 1982 to 1989. Before we started, he gave me some very wise words, uh, some great deanly wisdom that we'll take back 
Professor Pollock serves as the director of the university seminars founded in 1944 by Frank Tannenbaum with the goal of establishing groups, Columbia professors and experts from the whole region to explore matters no single department had the breadth or the agility to study. The Columbia University Seminar on Full Employment, Social Welfare, and Equity, one of the major sponsors of this meeting, focuses on the analytical and policy issues related to full employment, social welfare, and equity. These include cross-national perspective, primarily in industrialized countries, seeking to identify, to clarify the difficult and central intellectual questions related to uh, national commitment and capability to assure full employment, social welfare, and equity over the long run. From 1992 to 2012, Professor Pollack was director of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion program at the Earth Institute. In 2014, his interest in questions that lie at the in intersection of science and subjectivity, coupled with the gift of an endowment from college alumnus Harvey Kruger, 1951, led him to establish the Research Cluster on Science and Subjectivity, a project within Columbia's Center for Science and Society. Got a very impressive speaker today. In addition to this, Professor Pollock has authored many papers, reports, reviews, articles, opinion pieces on molecular biology, medical ethics, science education, as well as the following books, Signs of Life, The Language and Meaning of DNA, which won the Lionel Trilling Award and has been translated in six languages, The Faith of Biology and the Biology of Faith, Order, Meaning, and Free Will in Modern Science, and The Missing Moment, How the Unconscious Shapes Modern Science, the most recent book, Course of Nature, a book of drawings by the artist Amy Pollack, accompanied by Professor Pollock's short explanatory essays. I'm very pleased to introduce him today. Please welcome Professor Pollock. Wow. Um, me, and thank you, Trudy. Uh, as, as you heard, I'm here as director of Columbia University Seminar. I'll be left off on that. There are 90 of them now, and as he said, one is the one on full employment, social welfare, and equity, chaired by Trudy Goldberg, and uh, that's why the university seminars are co-sponsoring this program. There are about 3,000 members of seminars. There are 90 seminars. About 1,500 of them are not at Columbia. So I urge those of you who don't mind a long drive and then go on IRT. Take a look on the website for university seminars. Social welfare and equity. And why the university seminars would support them. Well, I have uh, four predecessors as director. The seminars were founded, as you said, in 1944. Their founder, a man, Frank Baum, Frank Baum was a, a student, not a he left his farm family in New York and came to Lower East Side and led a sit down strike of unemployed men in St. Bart's on Park Avenue. He was arrested, put in jail, wrote a letter. It was read by a wealthy woman who wrote to my predecessor, Dean, and paid his tuition when he was to left Columbia. And between World War I and World War II, he managed to get a PhD in Latin American Studies and to become a major figure at Columbia, founding the university seminars by convincing the president of university that in a war, departments and schools are irrelevant categories for dealing with large and serious issues. Three of the five initial seminars still exist. They live longer than any of their members. Uh, these are Renaissance, Religion, and the Problem of Peace. All of our seminars are civil because they are not public. There are no honoraria, but there are minutes kept. And we have an archive of 2 million pages of digitally searchable minutes over 70 years. 
and intellectual history of New York was renamed. The uh, second example would be my predecessor, his successor, um, uh, Aaron Warner. Aaron was social welfare and equity in action. In 1937, at age 29, became the head of the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board in Denver, the youngest member of the NLRB ever, with a Harvard Law School degree. He was subsequently investigated by the House of Representatives for his left wing leanings. He feared he became the head of the Railroad Retirement Board. He led the Price Control Office. In 1943, he enlisted in the Navy. In 1954, he became a PhD at Columbia. In 1968, he was one of the faculty that helped Columbia from falling apart in the 68th century. And he's the founder of the University of Frank has not stayed out of the classroom, continuing to teach part time at Metropolitan College in New York, whose curriculum caters to non traditional students and is grounded on experiential learning directed at improving the world. He is co author with Sam Bowles and Rick Edwards of the highly regarded economics textbook, Understanding Capitalism. By Sarah Lawrence on his retirement for teaching his students that, quote, economic systems are about more than money. They're an expression of moral principle. The so-called dismal science has the power to change people's lives and to create a more humane and just world. A small example of what that means to Frank is captured in his design of a new tuition plan for the Manhattan Country Day School. Country, Manhattan Country School based on the ability to pay, one in which no one is made to feel the recipient of charity. While tuition varies from one to the next child, everyone pays a fair share. In other words, people are in economic terms. Frank is now serving here as the honorary chair of celebrating New Deal New York City, the Living New Deal, based at the University of California, Berkeley. The Living New Deal, based at the University of California, Berkeley, has mapped over a thousand projects created by New Deal work programs and has just launched this inspiring map and guide to New Deal New York City. I hope you all fall for it. The launch of this map and guide, which celebrates the dual legacy of a progressive government that employed millions of jobless workers in building and renewing the nation's physical, cultural, and environmental resources is an opportunity to advocate a 21st century New Deal for our country and for our city. One that guarantees everyone human right to decent work. We are privileged to have Frank Roosevelt serve a living New Deal New York City. And I'll close by saying that his grandpa was president until I was five years old. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have known that since the 1970s, I first became involved in one of the Columbia University seminars. And uh, I'm great with Eric. I'm still the mover and shaker. Wonderful program, cheap attention. Many different seminars. I'm a member of. A member of Several of the seminars started to see more Melbourne in the seventies, the war and peace, now um, full employment seminar. So thank you very much, Dean Powell. I am here today not only because I believe in this project, but also perhaps when I was born in nineteen thirty-eight. Um, my father his name was Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr., persuaded my mother, sort of against her wishes, um, that I would be named Franklin D. Roosevelt III, grandchild. But since my father was junior, he had a right, I guess, to give me the name. <laughs> um, for much of my life, I've been a Roosevelt hiding under a rock, uh, intentionally. Uh, that's just the way I am. And uh, the Roosevelt legacy seemed like something I could never live up to, which is still true. 
Um, so I just tried to ignore it. And, uh, and I had some help. When I was a child, my mother had me called Joe. <laughs> But for me, um, very shortly, coming to terms with quote unquote being a Roosevelt, I was was quickly facilitated by my relationship with my grandmother, Eleanor Roosevelt. My grandfather had before I was seven years old. But my grandmother lived on I was fortunate in the middle of college, it took me that long to make it really see more of you. So at some point I said, okay, I would like to see more of you. And um, that summer I was studying at Harvard Summer School, transitioning in a early major in physics and economics. And I said, you know, I'm at Harvard Summer School. She said, oh, I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks, speaking to Henry Kissinger's international students. So we arranged to have the meet. I went to her lecture. I was blown away. She stands up for three, five minutes, talks about everything going on in the world without a note. I said, wow. So um, that was the beginning of a became closer relationship um, with her. But to digress, digress for a minute, when I was in college, I actually became interested in the New Deal, uh, which I had more or less avoided until then. <laughs> but, um, and I took a course in John Morton, John Morton Block, American historian. Um, and I wrote a paper for him on the Roosevelt Recession of 1937. I was an economics major, so I hardly combined. Uh, what I was studying with a little history. About the same time, at about that time, I began to really get who my grandfather was. You know, somehow I got to that point without uh, that. I began to respond to any old little birthday notes saying, I'd love to see more of you. So um, I said, Yes, I'd like to see more of you. And um, she, of course, uh, made herself available, invited me. I was in New Haven in college, and she would invite me to come down for lunch so, with amazing cast of characters. She would just have for lunch in her uh, little apartment on the east side, the president of the airlines, the ambassador from here, whatever. Um, but after I graduated from college, I had signed up in the late 50s when I went to college, we had compulsory military service. I said, I don't want to dig in between. So I signed up for ROTC. But when I graduated, I had I to go into the Navy and I was sent off to Japan. So that um, prevented me from having frequent meetings or any meetings until she passed away in 1962. But when I got for that, I wrote to her. And I, I wrote what might be called term papers for her. I was sent off, you know, should China really be admitted to the United Nations? <laughs> or um, help me out. I, I don't really know how to deal with William F. Buckley's critique of <laughs> Social Security. Uh, because he says it's immoral because it's coercive. Therefore, it's immoral. So I said, look, help me out, Romer. We call it Romer. She wrote back and said, well, <clears throat> to make the program financially viable, you have to have universal participation. As we do today with the Affordable Care Act. It, it won't fly without everybody <clears throat> participating, whether they really want to or see the need to or not. <clears throat> so that was a an important lesson that she 
sort of told me about, educated me about. <clears throat> so um, honoring her, I agreed to be co-chair in the 1990s of the project for a statue of Eleanor Roosevelt in Riverside Park. Um, and <clears throat> we uh, contracted, we did a search and found a wonderful sculptor for this statue, Helen James. And after what seemed like quite a long time, the statue was done. It's an eight foot high bronze figure. And it has been installed as planned, southern tip of Riverside Park. So, it, and we had Hillary Clinton, who was then, um, this is about 96, it was dedicated, and, and she was well known by then as the first lady, a big fan of Eleanor And so she agreed to come and was our keynote speaker for the dedication. Um, and if you haven't seen that sculpture, I would recommend that you somehow make your way over to 72nd Street and Riverside Drive. It's right there at the bottom end of Riverside Park, where ends and Donald Trump's massive mm. Riverside South development mm. starts, um, mm. which if you're driving up or down the West Side Highway, you will not miss. But when you get to the end of the Trump development, you could turn off at 72nd, and right there is the statue of my grandmother. Um, so I guess the point of all this, um, and I wasn't supposed to speak this long, but um, the point is, if we can bring Eleanor Roosevelt back to the West Side, we should be able to bring the whole New Deal back to New York City. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to learning a lot about the New Deal. Everybody assumes that I know everything there is to know about it, sort of genetically or something, but I don't. And I'm looking forward to learning a lot from the speakers this evening. And I'm extremely grateful to Will Hooper, who I've known since my days here in the late 60s, early 70s. He was a uh, very good friend of Robert Heilbrunner, who was really my mentor. And so Will was very receptive to our um, request to have this conference here. So the only price, only price you have to pay is that the new school has to become co-sponsor of the process, of the project. So I said, that's easy. You can be a co-sponsor. Um, so many thanks also to the Columbia University Seminars Program. Dean Pollock uh, has represented that and for supporting us with a grant um, to hold this, this session today. As, and also, of course, to the National Jobs for All Coalition, which really is the, the founding or the, the force behind this, and Trudy Goldberg, um, and Sheila Collins, who are both here, co-chair of that seminar, um, and, and the National Job. It's the Full Employment Seminar at Columbia, which is hand-in-hand -hand with the National Jobs for All Coalition, and they have really organized this program. And of course, to end uh, gratitude in advance to all of the speakers who will be explaining shortly why we should have a new New Deal today in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm not going to do any more thanks, because, um, but I will save them for, for later. But uh, Frank has really been much more than an honorary um, uh, chair of the uh, of, of this, of this uh, project. He's really hand in hand and very much of a, a very supportive all, all, all along. Um, I'm also going to change the program a little bit. I'm not going to speak. I didn't know if you, if I wrote it. <laughs> and so uh, I think it's always nice to have a program shortened a little bit. 
Um, so anyway, I, there's one thing I want to say about Frank that hasn't been said and that I didn't really know, and I said, in addition to his work, which has the laudable focus of, uh, of uh, combining socialist and market-based institutions in an attempt to make modern economic systems more fair and less prone to the winner-take-all, in addition to that laudable goal, he's also esteemed as an inspirational teacher who, as one devoted former student put it, taught his students to think critically, express thought carefully, and view the world with an open mind. And I think all of us who are teachers would like to get about it. Um, yeah, so, um, our speaker that I want to introduce now, here from Berkeley, uh, he's the founder of the Living Museum, which, by the way, has mapped 13,000 sites. Uh, and is responsible for this wonderful map of uh, New York City uh, New Deal. Um, there are a few of the San Francisco variants for me. I don't know, I hear some maybe they may going, be going to some other big city. Uh, after working as a journalist and television producer covering environmental and urban issues in San Francisco, Greg Reckon received his PhD in geography from the New uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And among his numerous published works is the Imperial San Francisco, Urban Power, Earthly Ruin, which spent 16 weeks on the Franco San Francisco Chronicle's bestseller list. The beleaguered women and men of the Depression era were all forgotten. But Gray says they really weren't forgotten because of what he calls the cadre of compassionate visionaries that swept into Washington. In founding Living New Deal, Gray has been a leader in keeping alive the memory of those visionaries. Proved our physical, environmental, and cultural resources, and at the same time, employed millions of jobless people, what we call the dual legacy of New Deal. 2,000 New Deal sites so far, and publishing maps and guides to San Francisco and New York City. Gray and his colleagues are inspiring us to build great things again. The lost ethical language of New Deal public work should be a treaty subject to this presentation. So I'll give you a second. I'm going to have to get rid of this in the morning. <laughs> I did on short notice to give you some idea of the many things that were done. Uh, for New York City, um, and so I, you know, we we had a the usual technical snafu at the beginning. I was thinking, of, you know, Forster's great short story, Machine Stops, um, which is a hundred years over a hundred years old, actually. Uh, let's see, this is where, um, and it's about how you know, at some point in the future, we all become so dependent on technology, which is so complex. And, and then it eventually just stops. Um, you must be. Um, okay, well, this is, as Sheila said, this is about the lost ethical language, which is what it intrigues me um, about the New Deal, so much about the, uh, the New Deal, because we've been studying the physical objects of the New Deal. And the reason, the, the way that I got into this was that over the years I became intrigued by things that I would see at my um, WPA sidewalk stamps. And also in parks like this one, and I was wondering, you know, well, what was this UPA, and why would the government um, go to so much trouble to build something that's simply beautiful, like the Berkeley Rose Garden, for example, which has a WK mark or in it, or Red Rocks Amphitheater, or this little amphitheater in North Berkeley, or um, the Mountain Theater on Mount Tamalpais, um, places that they bring people together, public golf courses, and um, uh, tennis courts and fly casting pools and big bridges um, like that one that I just photographed coming into Manhattan. Wonderful rustic structures in our national and state and regional parks and public markets and um, public parks. Um, I would say that the greatest work of art in New York City is not in the Metropolitan Museum of the British. It's Central Park. And that the greatest artist, of course, was Frederick Wall Olmsted, the great proponent and exponent of public works, as well as his son, Frederick Wall Olmsted Jr. Um, 
Oh, this is my favorite part of Central Park. Um, well, I'll go. I'll come back to that. The zoos in all five boroughs. The Conservatory Garden, um, WPA. Uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt Park in Lower East Side, and all the little pocket parks, and Bryant Park, which was restored um, by the by the uh, New Deal, and the Palisades with great structures by the CCC. As we began to um, research the New Deal public works, we began to think of it as a lost civilization, um, which was ours, actually, something that my parents built 80 years ago, but they wanted to tell me about because they were Republicans. And so, um, <laughs> so we had to dig this thing up. The records are terrible. You know, we really have to go through some of the crappiest microfilm I've ever worked with. But uh, fortunately, we had help. So what this is about is these physical objects are trying to speak to us in an ethical language that we have been persuaded to forget, much like the mind civilization. For example, um, when we started, well, when I started, I thought it would be a book. But very quickly we found it couldn't possibly be contained between the covers of a book. And then it occurred to me that we're now living in the 21st century with this annoying technology. And we could actually do um, an interactive website that we could be expanded into. So the, at first it was just California. Then we wholeheartedly decided we'd take on the whole country. And it just kept growing. And growing, and Sheila said, "Well, we're actually now closing in on 14,000 public sites, um, but we know that there are hundreds of thousands to go, possibly millions. What the CCC did, which is rather difficult to um, map. But I know what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life, and I'm really happy because it uh, makes me feel good. Um, now we have some a team of a crack team of great researchers." around the country. Uh, these are two of my favorites. The guy in the back is Brent He is from West Virginia. The guy in front is Kevin English. He does a lot more New York work. And these guys do lots of great research. We were at the National Archives together. Uh, Evan is photographing this crappy microfilm, which he then goes home, actually enters in for a database. I go, I don't have to do that. Um, and we decided that we would just, well, we had already mapped um, New Deal San Francisco, and then we decided to do New Deal New York. The next one will be New Deal Washington, D.C., um, so that um, the whether the Republicans like it or not, they'll find out that they were living, that they are living in the city. Um, here's New Deal New York with over a thousand points, and we're still finding more all the time. Um, now, much of what we know about the Depression, um, we get from the great photographs. Uh, taken for the Farm Securities Administration, which had a, uh, one of the many visionaries, Roy Stryker. And the problem with these great photographs by Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang and Russell Lee, et cetera, is that we think that the, new, that the Depression happened in black and white. But it didn't. In fact, all you have to do is to go onto our local streets and you will see the Great Depression. It is happening right now. It is happening all over the country. I travel around the country on the train. And I have been shocked at how the, the speed with which homeless and gamblers are now growing along all the railway right of ways. And about what I'm seeing now in New York City and Manhattan uh, is the same thing. People living on the streets, begging everywhere. Um, this is Denver. Um, this is a New Deal fresco, which is at Quake Tower in San Francisco. And I like this one because it conveys the anger that people felt in 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt came to power. And he knew that if he didn't do something quick to alleviate this problem, that there would probably be another revolution or civil war. And one civil war is too many for any country. He, he didn't want to have another one. So he set to work. He had the right time. He had that brilliant personality, which Churchill described as like a bottle of champagne. Um, he had a great speaking voice. And he wrote great speeches. And his speeches, unlike anything we've heard in previous administrations in my lifetime, have content in them. Um, and he's allowed to speak the English language, too, which doesn't seem like a big accomplishment. These days it is. Now, he was exact opposite of this guy. Um, that was after the crash of 2008, by the way. Um, this is 
Flurry Halpern's great Roosevelt Memorial on the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. And it's from his second bill, it's from his second um, inaugural address. The test of our progress is not whether we have more, to the abundance of those who have much, but whether we provide enough for those who have to do it. That is a fundamentally Christian statement. Um, unlike, again, anything we've heard for quite a few uh, presidential uh, administrations. This is the Roosevelt Family Bible printed in Amsterdam in the 17th century. Roosevelt had his finger on this, on a passage in this, in every one of his inaugurations. And the passage that he chose is this. Now abide of faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is the greatest Christian virtue. And we once considered it a virtue, in fact. Um, the my point is that the Roosevelts and the people they gathered around themselves were practicing rather than professing Christians. They weren't big into punishment. And when I when I think of the people that the Roosevelts gathered around themselves as well as they themselves, there are four words that come courage, compassion, ingenuity, and honesty. And again, uh, these are not things we are encouraged to connect with government these days. Uh, in Jane Mayer's profile of the Mercer family, for example, she said that if we, the people like the Mercers and the Koch brothers want us to think exactly the opposite about the government because then we we'll want to get rid of it. Um, now, there are two buildings in this town that were, I think, very instrumental in the New Deal. This is one of them, the University Settlement House on the Lower East Side. This is where Eleanor um, worked in the settlement house um, early in the, in the 20th century. Um, many of the new dealers actually worked in settlement houses. And this is where they absorbed this ethos that we must attack poverty at its root. We don't deal with it simply. The other one is the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, factory um, near Washington Square. Uh, Francis Perkins, the great Secretary of Labor, um, witnessed the horrible fire at this factory, and she said it changed her life. And she was, in many ways, the mother of the New Deal, the intellectual mother of the New Deal, largely because of what she saw on that horrible day. Um, one of the projects of the federal um, of the New Deal did was the Federal Theater Project under Hallie Planet. And one of my favorite plays is One Third of the Nation, which was inspired by Roosevelt's statement that I see one third of the nation ill clad, ill, Ill clad, ill fed, and ill house. Ill house. Thank you. Okay. Um, and um, it's a remarkable play. I had the opportunity to see it here off Broadway a few years ago. 11 actors playing 110 roles. It was quite, uh, quite an epic. Um, it starts out with a tenement house fire, and it really deals with the horrible housing conditions. Um, and the WPA actually did research so that it was, on which it was based. But one of the most remarkable things of it, which is why I'd like to see it staged again, is there is an act in which um, uh, how uh, real estate speculation is explained to the ordinary person, in which this sort of hurry wig um, landowner stands off of the side while more and more people pile on top of a rectangle. Uh, and you can see very quickly how it leads to great poverty. Um, and this is one of the reasons that the Federal Theater Project was one of the first killed by an increasing public in Congress. Now, we live in these people's world now um, with statements like, and this is the result. Um, we have now a massive public health epidemic. It's not surprising at all that this is their world. The point I want to make is that if anything describes the New Deal, it is public in its widest possible dimension, which includes education and so much else, transportation, parts, everything else. How can the government, government at its best, be used the health of not only of the individual, but of society itself. Again, it's something we don't really talk about. So among the things that it did was to build great public hospitals, uh, teaching hospitals. Um, it gave medical care to people who never had the opportunity for that before. Well, baby clinics. Um, free school lunches, rather than taking it away from children, as we do today. Um, 
It helped out people afflicted with polio um, and built beautiful orthopedic hospitals around the country with warm pools by Roosevelt's experience with warm springs. And it encouraged scientific research rather than Muslim the scientists. It gave us clean drinking water. Within about seven years, Americans, a minority, went from having a dangerous drinking water to having clean drinking water. We've been taking that for granted ever since, even though it's all breaking down. Um, this is a WPA-made model of Queens Museum of the um, Broken Water System. It explains it education. It explains to people where your water comes from. And it, well, these buildings also speak to us. They speak of political virtue. Um, uh, this is almost incomprehensible to you. In New York City, um, the, the given credit for so many of the projects you will see on the map, of course, of Robert Moses, and that's not really, that's not accidental. But what we're trying to do is to move the credit over from these guys, Franklin and Fiorello. Um, and one of the reasons that it's not known, and Robert Moses hated each other. Um, this was known among the and Franklin did not appreciate it. Um, so, among the many things that they did was aid public education. Around the country, they built thousands of new schools, fireproof schools, beautiful ones. Um, this is Howard University. My favorite is Brooklyn College, um, which looks Ivy League College on a quad, but this is a college which has given generations of immigrants the opportunity for um, education that they would never have had. Um, the students there in the library have the opportunity for a WPA mural, which is extraordinarily aspirational. This is what we must aspire to. Um, it, Fortunately, named LaGuardia Hall because LaGuardia had so much to do with getting it built. These buildings speak to us. This is not in New York, this is actually in the state of Oregon, but all over the country you'll see new build deal buildings. They're trying to speak to us. If only we would listen. This is in the New York Public Library. So much of the art in our public libraries is about the transmission of knowledge from one generation to another, not the accumulation of massive data, but wisdom. This is in the um, Oregon um, State Library. Fiorello himself believed passionately in this. He believed that the airwaves were a public trust. And so, in fact, he used the WPA to move uh, the broadcasting power for NY, uh, NYC um, to, um, to a three point and to increase its broadcasting. And he, of course, used that as well as Franklin Roosevelt. Um, using it. Um, they believed in public art. Fortunately, New York has a great collection of public work of art. And unfortunately, a lot of it is no longer public because it's in the school and we can't get into the schools anymore. They gave music lessons. This is a remarkable uh, photograph of a, of a young girl who was born without hands. They created, the WPA created a custom um, design on She actually gave concerts. Um, they took music out to the public, as well as theater, and it, for, there were performances that were either free or very low cost. There were WPA orchestras. This, the woman on the left is Audrey McMahon, and she was in charge of the WPA art projects in New York City. And one of the artists was so grateful, many of them were, that she, she did this sculpture of Audrey, which I'm not sure that Audrey appreciated, but it was about the abundance which uh, she made possible. And then Franklin loved history and wanted other people to do so as much. He really knew history, unlike this other guy. Um, he really appreciated it. He also, by the way, had read the Constitution and he was capable of understanding it. Um, so he gave the nation the first um, presidential library because he had this odd idea that Americans should be uh, were entitled to knowing what their presidents had done. And so he designed the library, it's still up there at Hyde Park. It's naked as far as I'm concerned. As a historian, I appreciate what the WPA did to organize and preserve public records. This is the New York City records, 
And if it hadn't been organized by WPA workers, we probably wouldn't have it. It would just be a great lacuna where, where it was. Uh, here they are in that same way. And one of the most remarkable things that they did, and this is, speaks to the ingenuity of it, a federal writer's project under, under Henry Allsberg and the author of his new biography, Susan Amasi, is here. Um, and Henry sent out um, WPA workers to record the memories of slaves at the end of their lives, in their 90s and over 100. And otherwise, we wouldn't know what the conditions of slavery actually were. And this is one of the things that we're trying to do with the Living New Deal. We're facing the same thing with the veterans of the CCC and the other. We must interview them and get their memories as soon as possible. And there was a great concern for public mind. What is this guy doing? He's restoring this thing um, out in the harbor. And I like to think that if the WPA hadn't strengthened the Statue of Liberty, it might not have been able to withstand Hurricane Sam. And they also did all the landscaping on the island as well, too. This is not after the earthquake uh, in Washington, D.C. The PWA restored the Washington Monument, and it restored the whole Capitol Mall. So that the mall, um, and so much of Washington, D.C. is actually New Deal, but we don't know that. Um, here is um, some of the monuments in, and the memorials, et cetera, in New York City that are restored. This is Washington Square in Williamsburg. And I searched all over, there's no plot. As a matter of fact, New York City is the only city I've ever been into where I could not find any WK marker. I don't think that's accidental. I think Robert Moses did that quite a bit. Finally, um, there's Roosevelt's great speech of the four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Now, what that, that uh, inscription does not say is that after everyone, he said everywhere in the world. And it's, it's out there actually on the four freedoms part, which is this. Which, if you haven't been out there, you look over to the right and you see the United Nations. That was his idea. And the reason was that the Roosevelt's had both experienced World War I. They didn't want to see another one. And there's a great new exhibition up at the Roosevelt Houses on 65th Street, which is about the Roosevelt in the First World War. He said, more than an end to war, we want an end to the beginning of all wars. And to do that, he understood that we must attack ignorance and poverty. And I think one of the reasons, and that would be with the United Nations, and I think the reason for that was, among other things, the Roosevelt had authorized in that hacking project. And he knew that the next World War would be the last. So this is the way we live now. Um, as I come around on trains, I see empty factories. You know, those men would have been working, and they should be working now. Roosevelt said in a great um, Second Bill of Rights speech, necessitous men are not free men. Education is the defense of the state. That's something that we really need to remember. This is something I just saw track crossing the country. The homeless encampments I see erupting everywhere. This is an epidemic that we are not addressing. We, we talk about the symptoms of it, we do not talk about the cause of it. I feel like I'm living in the ruins of a once great civilization. So recently in New York, I saw this little town square. It's filled with the monuments of the veterans of our many, many wars. of the WPA improved this square. Uh, there are monuments all over the country. This is Indianapolis, Washington, D.C. There are no monuments to the men and women of our great peacetime armies, which have largely been forgotten. We need another one. This is the CCC, which left us a legacy of such beautiful um, rock work. These are the, the records that uh, they organized. I'm standing on people's shoulders. We all are. And what they did was they created what Tom Brokaw called the Great. That is largely because of the New Deal and what they did. We have to look at what these are trying to say to us, remember that, and honor those people. We have to aim high. What we want to do now is to create the first New Deal Museum. But it will be a museum that won't so much with, that will look back, but also will look forward to the future to the possibility of full employment, of jobs, for that's what this whole conference is about. Not just jobs, but living wage jobs. In his second Bill of Rights speech, 
He said, everyone is entitled to a remunerative job and one which is socially useful. So that's what we must do. So thank you very much. So thanks so much. Um, I, you know, in listening to what Craig just presented, it reminds me of the phrase from Duncan Galbraith about uh, private opulence, public squalor. And uh, the question is, do we dare to dream a big dream? And I think you're all here tonight because you believe in the promise of public investment, very good, decent jobs for everybody who wants to work. Um, so it's going to take us just a few seconds. We're going to uh, connect uh, Representative Marcy Cather by Skype. And going to talk to us about the 21st Century Civilian Conservation Corps bill that she's introduced. We're going to kind of fast forward to the future. Here's a national leader who wants to go to the deal. Uh, so if you give us just a few minutes, we're going to get her on the line. Well, how, then I can thank people while yeah, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Got to get my thank you notes out. <laughs> from here? Is that better? Sure. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, some people say I speak into the mic too much. Is that okay? Okay. I want to thank our major sponsors and co-sponsors, especially the Columbia University Seminar on Full Employment and Social Welfare and Equity, which is of the Columbia, Sem uh, Columbia Seminar. The seminar has for 30 years served as a kind of think tank for our ideas about full employment. Hosting events like this in a conference on the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. Um, by the way, the co-chairs of the seminar are Helen Black Ginsburg, who I saw come in, and, and who really was kept the seminar going for a number of years when I personally wasn't very active, and Sheila Collins. The seminar had to try it. Um, I want to thank, though, so, uh, Dean Milberg and, uh, for hosting us today, and Carol Glauber, the Associate Director for Staff of the Affairs, Affairs who patiently paved every step of the way uh, for us here. Uh, our honorary sponsor, I've already thanked Frank Roosevelt, who was much more hands-on than honorary, uh, much sage counsel and encouragement throughout. Uh, he's an active member of our seminar. Um, our, we have a committee largely of the National Jobs for All Coalition, co-chair Sheila Collins, the major responsibility for planning, um, and uh, also particularly for an earlier conference for social studies teachers. And along with Noreen Connell and me began meeting and talking with possible co-sponsors of this whole project nearly two years ago. I might say we were somewhat in over. Um, Phyllis Harvey is another member of the, of the uh, committee. What would we do without his knowledge and leadership in legislative initiatives? Chuck Bell, our dynamic vice chair. David Cundy, our graphic artist, who made us look very, very good, as you see from our posters and our, um, our program. Um, <clears throat> Greg Hires of DC 37, Ed Rosario of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, and uh, Rabbi Michael Feinberg. Um, of the New York Labor Religion Coalition advisors and publicized their work. Uh, Jeff Gold, who had wears so many hats, I had to ask him what he is uh, the director of the Institute for Urban um, Mobility and uh, also Healthcare for All in New York, and he was with us all the way. Steve Lieberstaff, Congress of CUNY, 
and and uh, and also of the New York Labor History Association, major project up to public life and along with Irving Yellowwood of uh, the New York Labor History Association. Um, mountain Company of Plan and Mountain All Day Harness, New York City Social Studies teachers. Um, um, that, uh, and by the way, um, a thousand copies of the map guide are being made available to those for classroom use, and they're uh, going to be emphasizing the Great Depression this year. And I also want to um, uh, mention uh, uh, Arthur Kelly Otis, president of CWA 1180, who provided support and all throughout. Tonight we have here Ronan Gray and Raul Carrillo of the Modern Money Network that has added greatly, a great dimension to this conference because often, you know, we get very enthusiastic at a conference and sort of uh, it ends with the last word of the last speaker. But we have all day tomorrow to work plan uh, a strategy for ongoing work uh, and also for supporting uh, a job guarantee or um, jobs for all from your city. We're going to hear more about it in the second half of the program. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, Representative Kapter, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Vice Chair of the National Can you hear me? Okay. And do we have, uh, we might need a little help getting her sound. Um, hang on just a second. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. That's, that's great. Uh, Can you hear us? Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, Representative Captain, I'm sorry you can't see everyone here, but we've had over 150 people registered tonight. Uh, quite a few people here right now. And if I could just take a second to introduce you. Um, Representative Marcy Kaptur is the uh, representative from the 9th Congressional District, Iowa, which includes Cleveland and Toledo. She's the longest serving woman in the House of Representatives. She's on her 17th term. She's been a fantastic friend to national jobs for all coalition. As I mentioned, she uh, introduced the 21st century Civilian Conservation Corps, at least as long ago as 2009, and maybe you were fighting for it before then. Uh, and this is a bill that would um, give uh, thousands of Americans opportunities to have a public service job again. Uh, so, Re Representative Captain, we'd love to hear your thoughts and, and uh, ideas on how we can build a new deal in the 21st century. Well, first of all, thank you and uh, all of your great uh, audience. I heard some of the credits. When we first uh, opened the program, can you hear me all right? You know, Dr. Yes. Bell? Yeah, good. All right. And I want to thank your city. I want to thank all those who the traffic in our city. I'm uh, going to your location. Uh, are you at Columbia University? Uh, we're at the new, the new school. You're at the new school. Yes. All right. We had a former member uh, of Congress who was one of your presidents. And uh, I know the innovative work. Yes, from Tri-State area, New York, and New Jersey. Well, let me tell everybody sitting there. Now, I'm from Humble, Ohio. All right, I hear that New York punches above its weight. <laughs> all right, the United States, uh, because of the rate of settlement, history, the amount of money that flows through your state, uh, your members really have added firepower to build that, and they can help to. 
make things happen uh, in the Congress of the United States. New York has a very progressive tradition on so many levels, certainly for women's rights in our country and the advancement of women. And uh, we are very grateful for all the members that you sent to uh, the Congress of the United States. I had the pleasure of working with all of them, and they do buy them up. Uh, as you hear about this bill and next take a greater interest in it, I try to convince uh, several congresses and, and presidents uh, to uh, consider this, adapt it if they wish, but to really do it for the sake of the nation. And I see that uh, chart behind you, that poster. Look at our libraries, our bridges, our public buildings, our zoos. And we go back uh, to the 1930s. It was absolutely incredible what that generation did for our country. Yeah. If you come to the House of Representatives, above the speaker's rock, the quote from Daniel Webster. And that quote urges all of us something in our time and generation worthy to be remembered. They certainly did that in that very difficult economic time. We know in our country today, there still remain millions of people who are outside the regular economy for one reason and another, and we have great unmet national needs. In my region of the country, we have to replant 20 million trees. Because of the infestation of a certain type of insect, the emerald ash borer, uh, and other parts of the country have had the Asian longhorn beetle. Just in the area of tree planting, we have an enormous load. I was just speaking with a gentleman from the other side of the aisle, Mr. Ken Conrad, who's chair of one of my subcommittee house, Interior, which has jurisdictional and forest service. And this past week, as a result of the historic fires out there, I was talking to him about the case of Nawa. We know that we spent the majority of the money in the U.S. Forest Service in fighting fires. But we have fired because we have not managed forest well. That was pushed uh, back. And so what happens is you nearly propagate more fires, fires that are hotter, fires that spread over a larger area. He told me, that just in California, have to clean out 100 million trees and logs just in that state. So you add up what knows about his state, what I know about my state, vast reserves of this country in terms of forest stewardship. That alone would take everybody that we bring into this program. Uh, and I wrote this bill long before. We had these latest set of, of really um, numbing fires. He told me something interesting about these fires, that they were so hot that they burned the seeds themselves. So all of the hillsides will have to be replanted in a way where you physically break a uh, product. Like so maybe the military has some kind of a machine where we could just shoot it into the hillsides, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and the very mountainous areas there that are now stripped of, of vegetation. So we have a gigantic job just on the conservation side. Our bill is called the 21st Century Civilian Conservation Corps Act. And essentially what it does is it mobilizes the federal government, including many departments. Uh, we're not exclusive to the Department of Interior, but the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, the National Guard Bureau, they have a great ability, by the way. I don't know if the New York Guard does, but it's good to find out because uh, they can many times lead. My vision is that the Guard would lead teams of individuals who perhaps would be getting training at the same time while they are conducting some of these activities. Um, and uh, they have uh, trucks, they have shovels, they have all kinds of the generators, things that you need in order to do the kind of work that we're talking about here. It would involve the Environmental Protection Agency, where that is appropriate. So our bill goes through two departments that could be involved in this. And it urges the president to recreate this activity, which the generation of the Great Depression fully understood. My own father 
uh, worked for the CCC for a while and was digging canals in those states. Uh, the federal work with our governors and our mayors and local officials to figure out which projects would get priority. But literally, a young person, a young man or a young woman, would be selected if they are not working, if they are recently graduated, they don't have a job. Someone has been outsourced, their job has been outsourced, and they don't have work selected. There's no age limit uh, on this, and they could become a part of one of these uh, work teams. And the bill uh, essentially talks about works. They could help them to restore a uh, river band, tar cover, working in conjunction with Army Corps of Engineers, for example, and other uh, public projects that need to be accomplished. So that's a Bit of a summary, a real tricky part of the bill, and one that I am not completely with. But of course, you have to pay for everything. And we have a section in the bill that talks about using unobligated funds in the federal government, and uh, the cost of this would be $16 billion. That's what they be. That is so it's not a, a small and uh, over uh, several years, we were looking at 2018. 2021. And uh, but keep in mind our defense budget totaled well over $700 billion a year. So $16 billion compared to that, you know, it's really, uh, really modest as Washington goes. And uh, depending on the amount of money that we would have appropriated and allocated, that would cover and how many people would actually be come a part of this uh, initially. So that's a little bit about uh, the program. The bill is very specific in terms of the kinds of projects in which individuals could be involved. Uh, that's on page uh, two of the bill. By the way, the bill's number is 2226. It talks about forestation of land belonging to the United States or our state, uh, prevention of forest fires, floods, and soil erosion. Flooding is becoming an enormous issue. Notice what happened in Florida in Alabama uh, because of changing meteorological conditions. Our coast, the North knows this so well uh, because of what uh, Sandy did in, in your region. So we have to look at our freshwater and our natural rainfall in a different way because of what is happening in the environment. So flood prevention is very important. Soil erosion, which impacts regions of the country like mine so directly. Um, dealing with uh, the uh, paths, we probably have a lot of walking paths, trails, uh, national park system. I could go on and on. No mention the kinds of projects, many of the very environmental in nature that our citizenry could become involved. And so that's a bit of a sum. Thank you so much. So I would just comment one thing I noticed in reviewing the list of 16 co-sponsors we have currently, we do not have any co-sponsors from New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut. So that's certainly a call to action we can make right here is going home, you know, over the weekend or on Monday, if you can reach out to your representatives of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor uh, HR 2406. Um, do we have some questions for Representative Captor? Yes, please. Okay. The bill is uh, focused on forest. Forest is also very important. It's basically on how the water that Otherwise, we don't have that. Obviously, it's attacking the water and all that. What solutions are there in this that look? Critical function that far. Okay. Uh, the question is that um, there's a lot of issues related to erosion of forests that could affect the drinking water quality in the United States. So, is the focus of the bill, does it have some provisions to try to protect quality of drinking water for the public that would be public service jobs? That is the kind of project that is eligible to uh, make the actual language available if you don't have it there. Um, but uh, 
and the environmental improvements that are needed across the country. And I come from a region where we have huge amounts of runoff that are because of added rainfall. We have five inches more than we normally do out here in the Great Lakes region this year. And I represent a watershed in the Great Lakes, Lake Erie. In fact, the New York Times just had a big uh, picture of what it looks like out here with all of the algal blooms that are um, very ripe and there's sometimes some toxins in them that are very harmful to fresh water uh, for human uh, consumption. So this is, this is a big issue, and we have to build wetlands all over the country. We have to, when I was born, there were 146 million people in this country. I won't tell you what year that was, you guess. Yeah. And uh, today we have about 340 million, and by 2050, estimated we will be achieved toward 400 million. But no more water is me. Fresh water we have only finite. There's a certain amount. So we have to really think about the country today and the pollution of our streets and the erosion that is occurring because of green rainfall is real. So those of you who are studying the environment, those of you who are thinking about the relationship between people and resources, you are going to be so needed. We need more hydrologists in this country. Almost every water system, I can't imagine the individual that runs the New York water and sewer system, individuals. But I would bet that they have trouble getting some of the talent that they need and some of their most eager people retire uh, because people weren't necessarily conscious of this, but yet we know it's happening around the country. We have a very, very weak bench coming up. And we aware of what is happening, water policy with hydrology, with erosion, with agricultural practices across our country. Uh, it's the earth is the sun is choking right now. And we have to recognize that reality. Uh, I have a little story to tell you for some of the members of your audience who are younger. When I was uh, in college and I went to uh, on a class, uh, on a trip with one of my classes, he met then Senator Gaylord Nelson, and he was a senator from Wisconsin. And I remember that as I grew older, that at one point when I got to the Congress, he was retiring. But he was the father of Earth Day. So you sometimes get discouraged and you think, oh gosh, nothing will ever happen. But we have to make things happen. It just don't happen. He's a great senator, honorable man. Veteran of World War II, just a great man, very humble. He wasn't showing up, just did his work. And after he ultimately left the Congress, he went on to work uh, with the, I think it was the National uh, Defense, uh, uh, National oh, Defense Resources Council, or one of the one of the major uh, environmental organizations. And uh, but he was the father of Earth in 1970. There was a time in America. When we didn't have that. And now people celebrate the Earth Day, but someone actually created it, right? Uh, in the Congress of the United States. It didn't come from a president, it came from a senator. And then what happened was Senator uh, Ed Muskie, who was then alive, from I believe Maine, uh, saved uh, two years later when the Clean Water Act was passed. Um, the President of the United States in those days, so did. And it came back to the Senate, and with the leadership of Senator Muskie, was overridden, the veto was overridden. And the same happened in the House of Representatives. So there are things that happen that are very interesting. Fight, but it's been a very productive fight in some states. And uh, we are a healthier nation than we were before. From an environmental standpoint, we have a long way. Thank you. I think I have a couple more questions. Yes? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Representative. Um, you mentioned that all these programs need to be paid for, but we have a sovereign currency that we issue in this country, and the Republicans are quite comfortable spending on military spending without any pay for and even the budget director comfortable abandoning these sort of, so to speak, fiscal conservative principles when it suits them. 
I'm curious why the narrative is actually constructed for the Democratic Party and for these kinds of policies rather than a noose that stops us from getting these policies done when everything has to be costed in a way that with the way that monetary policy actually works, but also causes uh, people to not be willing to join this coalition when they see tax increases attached to it that don't need to be attached. Well, uh, one could have fundamental reform in our monetary system, but I don't think it's going to happen uh, before this bill sees the light of day. Um, and I think we have to operate under the, the procedures that exist right now. And for us, I think this is very doable. Uh, first of all, a number of people now know that we have neglected our forests, that we have neglected our park system, neglected our trails. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. And uh, we spend any, your park spend an enormous amount of money on uh, war and on our military. Uh, I mean, since I can remember the Defense Committee. And uh, just yesterday in Ukraine, uh, I co-chaired the Ukrainian caucus, a young man probably about your age, I couldn't see him ask the question, um, but a journalist uh, was uh, uh, bombed uh, inside a small studio in the capital, and uh, others were killed. He survived. He has very serious injuries. <coughs> and um, uh, the struggle for liberty is not over. And there are very nefarious creatures out there who for whatever reason, you know, believe a different, um, believe differently than we do. And um, so we have to play the piano on many keys. Key I'm playing tonight really is the Civilian Conservation Corps. And I'll have to say for the monetary system, we have to leave that for another day. But we're correct that there were many members this week of the Freedom Caucus who will claim that they are deficit hogs who just voted to increase the deficit by over a trillion and a half dollars uh, in the book they cast the other day and uh, for the budget. Well, I think it's uh, that they cannot uh, walk the walk and talk the talk uh, when, it, when the rubber really hits the road. Thank you. Um, one more, or a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you very much for all this. Um, I'd like to know more about the people who will participate in this new CCC. Will you be recruiting to get the CCC young people? Will they go to work sites? Will this do anything for our young people? And will they, you know, they used to get paid, what, $25 a month? Most of them are all bigger than that. Go for it. So, what about the plan on this? All right. If you if you read the legislation, uh, the number one category that we start with are unemployed veterans uh, uh, or unemployed member components of our armed forces. Uh, unemployed citizens who have exhausted their entitlement to unemployment compensation. Unemployed citizens who uh, could not. Uh, continue receiving benefits at the state level. And uh, so we're looking at both we not currently have one bill. And it also offers in the bill at the discretion of the executive branch and we would provide funding for this. You talked about what you remember of the CCC historically, uh, basic necessities, clothing, medicine, the roof over their head. Uh, frankly, I think it'd be really good to have people come to other parts of the country and get some degree. But because of what happened to the economy over the last 15 years, and because of war, for many, many people kind of trapped <coughs> where they live, and they don't get a chance to really broaden their horizon. Um, though this is a shocking number, I'll give it to you, and it troubles me in my own work. Only 1% of the families of this country actually is not the one military. That means 99% of our people I never have the opportunity to travel, to work in a team, to uh, maybe even go abroad uh, to use their uh, benefits, uh, accrue through military service, go on to new school, to 
go on to college afterwards with the trade school. So we have a lot of individuals who really have a limited horizon. I think we see every person I ever talked to the business, and we had lots of them out there. But they said it was the transformative moment of their life when they left their neighborhood. And I'm not against people repairing their own neighborhood, believe me. But to take someone from the heart of New York City and walk them down on a hillside in California uh, is a, a um, epiphany. And vice versa. And it would be good for us as a country. I think for people from the Great Lakes to go down to Louisiana, a control project. I think we kind of come up to the Great Lakes and deal with some of the soil erosion issues that we are facing as we speak here. It's raining again outside my window. <laughs> so we know what that means for the water quality here. And uh, so I do want the American people to get to know one another and to get to know this magnificent complex country better. Thank, thank you. Uh, let's close with one question from Rabbi Feinberg. Yeah. Uh, I was going to, I'd like to get your perspective. We saw the campaign trail, but President did speak about his commitment to infrastructure and rebuilding of it. This is something that fits in his vision. In fact, he has one at all, or what he's talking about is purely privatized contracting. Now, it really wouldn't be. And the other piece of it is why not talk about? Uh, okay, the, la the last part is what about having a financial transactions tax on Wall Street bonds and securities to help finance a program like this, such as HR 1000 to do and some other bills for the property tax? Yes, well, you know, um, I've had several bills where I tried to tax bonds and transactions like Capital. And one of my friends, another congressman, uh, took that idea from HR 1000 and suggested it. And uh, Wall Street went after him about uh, a million dollars against him in the next campaign. So, uh, you know, these proposals are not counter responsive. I'm not saying it should be done because I do for taxing the capital uh, to raise the tax burden on the middle class. Uh, and I don't support the current tax measure that's being talked about in the United States. It's 80% of the benefits, not 1%. Uh, many of the middle class will pay more, certainly in New York State, New York State and local taxes. Uh, though they're saying now uh, maybe they might raise that out of the blue. How are they going to find the revenue that they're talking about to give these uh, tax uh, breaks? And uh, they literally uh, increase taxes on the lowest debt. So it's not a it's not a balanced proposal, and I don't think it'll pass. But the uh, idea of taxing Wall Street and stock trades and so forth, this is the future swaps. I actually support that. Uh, whether it's for this program or another program, one can figure about well, should it be 0.25 or should it be 0.025, you know, we'll let the math machine work on all that and make it at least harmful uh, to financial trades. But you know, honestly, the way I feel as both a citizen and a member of the House of Representatives, and, and that is they owe us something. They owe the American people uh, much more than they pay back in some of the fines that have been levied against these companies. African Americans in this country lost 40 their accumulated wealth since the founding of the Republic. Uh, Latino Americans lost about a third, and the rest of us uh, probably lost 20% of our accumulated wealth. That is because of the slums. Uh, and many people, frankly, have never recovered. This morning I was at an event for weatherizing a home of a woman who lost her job, uh, worked in a company for over 30 years, and Never saved in a fall one case, she didn't make enough. And so she ended up not old enough to go on Social Security. And now she's paid $500, about $1,500 over the colder months for propane, and she can't afford it. So we have a federal program for weatherization. 
try to weatherize her home so she doesn't do so much heat out of her home in the wintertime. Um, they are still needing a light bath. Who uh, are just barely hang on. And the homes on Wall Street, you know, are in the housing sector. Uh, are just playing well. They're getting larger profits than they ever had before. And this is a country. This is a country where we're just individuals. And everybody has a shoulder there. You know, put the shoulder to look. And so when he says infrastructure, I'm sure he's not fully the lot of who he friend in New York City. I he was first uh both of you, but um uh, uh I thought, well, at a minimum he's a builder. Maybe there'll be something there that we can work with. Uh, he would, because when they talk about infrastructure, the first thing I think of is roofs. The people out in my area can't afford roofs. I have neighbors who can't afford heaters, who can't afford to put roofs on. I thought, what if we weatherized it and look? That would be a part of the infrastructure. So cleaning up these forests, rid of all of the dead trees, the underbrush, that's infrastructure. But are we only talking roads and bridges? Or are we talking more broadly about the needs of the country? I, he may not have thought that through, and Rabbi and others who are listening, you got a lot of pull in New York City there. Maybe you can find some of the president's friends so that work with development, and uh, obviously he's the governor of New Jersey somewhat, you know, use some of your political power. Don't be afraid to use it. You know, you might regret that you didn't someday. You might be able to really, uh, his thinking broad. I'm sure if you ask them, Say, that sounds like a good idea. You know, which nobody ever suggested. All right. And I'll give you another secret about a lot of Washington, many, many, many good people. But so many are lawyers, which means they think about process. And that's important, but not fun. And infrastructure and housing and roofing and trees, these are products. And it, it's just a different mindset, a different way of putting our arms around the world that we live in. And that the president strikes me as someone who is a le less of a process person and more of a product person. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Kaptur, uh, for taking the time to talk to us. <laughs> and also, uh, you know, uh, we stand with you in your fight to create a new civilian conservation corps, and we'll be pleased to work and recruit some co-sponsors. And thank you for fighting that for that woman who needs the warm house in your district, who needs the weatherization, and fighting for your constituents. We know we can always count on you. Thank you. Now we have a Thank you. All right. So now it's time for refreshment. So please. Um, a little bit brief because we have a very, very important part of our program. Our economists are going to hear about uh, from the uh, public advocates office about a bill for a job guarantee. So don't go away. But enjoy your food. <laughs> I mean, I think she's a little more middle of the road. She's like a, 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 a,
Yeah. Well, I hear you. I mean, everybody. By the way, I don't have a schedule. I looked at two oh. of your. Oh, we'll look at the first one. Two of your. Second one has. Yeah, but let, let, me get, let me get the print. But Rowan, uh, Rowan has it. Thank <laughs> you. 